I think the mandate that the Sri Lankan people have given him is one of enthusiasm, but it is, if you like, conditioned by a certain amount of caution. And that is why he didn't get the 50 uh, plus one vote that is required on the first count. If you take his votes and Sajid Premadasa's together, I think one can talk about a basic mandate for change, a yearning for change. Those who voted for Anur uh, Kumara Desanayaka are obviously those who are angry, who are very much part of that Aragalaya mentality of saying that, look, the existing political order has been corrupted, it's decrepit, it needs to be got rid of, we need to introduce a new political culture. Anur Kumara Desanayaka is in himself a very popular candidate and and what's important also to emphasize is is that he's really the first candidate from the common man he's of the people he doesn't come from colombo he doesn't come from a dynasty none of that so in that sense he has a popular acceptance and a popular legitimacy anura kumara jishanaka is probably the best candidate that a party with the baggage that the JVP carries from 88, 89, the terror and all of that, is probably the best candidate that they could have put forward. Now he has become president. And the question is, is he going to be a real decision maker and the real leader? Or are there other people in the party, perhaps more wedded to the old, old ideology of the party who will call the shots? That remains to be seen somewhat. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Sri Lanka has a new president and he was sworn in early this morning. His name is Anura Komara Desanaika. So today we ask, what do we know about Anura Desanaika? How big a change does he represent? What will his presidency mean for Sri Lanka? And what sort of relationship is he likely to seek with India? Joining me from Colombo to help answer those questions is the Executive Director of the Centre for Policy Alternatives, Paikya Sothi Saravanamuttu. Dr. Saravanamuttu, the first time since the Executive Presidency was created in 1977, you've had a presidential election that's gone into the second round where, prefer where preferential votes are counted because no candidate got 50% in the first round. Eventually, Anura Komara Desanayake won. How would you describe the mandate the Sri Lankan people have given him? Well, I think the mandate that the Sri Lankan people have given him is one of enthusiasm, but it is, if you like, conditioned by a certain amount of caution. And that is why he didn't get the 50 uh, plus one vote that is required on the first count. If you take his votes and Sajid Premadasa's together, I think one can talk about a basic mandate for change, a yearning for change. Those who voted for Anur uh, Kumara Desanayake are obviously those who are angry, who are very much part of that Aragalaya mentality of saying that, look, the existing political order has been corrupted, it's decrepit, it needs to be got rid of, we need to introduce a new political culture. But remember, Anur stood on two basic planks, one was that, look, the other two parties, the old parties of the elites, have been given a chance for the last 76 years and they've messed up the country. Secondly, that only his party would do anything seriously with regard to corruption, which is absolutely toxic as far as the Sri Lankan system of government and governance is. So now what he is going to face is, apart from working with the existing bureaucracy and the agreements that are made, particularly with the IMF, to ensure debt sustainability, sorry, debt as restructuring and all of that, he's also going to have to put, I would say, a big fish, if you like, behind bars for corruption. And that needs to be done reasonably fast because he's had press conferences and all of that with loads of files saying, here is the evidence. But the question that people ask is, is that evidence sufficient to convict someone in a court of law? Or then will he have to go through 
to an extrajudicial mechanism to do that work on corruption. There's something you said that I'd like to pick up on. You said people voted for him in anger. And therefore, would you say this is a vote for him or is it an anti-establishment vote, particularly if you take together the percentage that went to Mr. Prebhadasa and the percentage that went to Mr. Disanaika? Yes, I think it is a vote for anger in general. Anur Kumara Disanaika is an attractive candidate, but it is more than just his personal attributes that has found got this result. It is also an anger about the system and wanting a system change. The Aragalea got the Rajapaksas out of government. They didn't get them out of politics. And so this is part of that sentiment of wanting to clean up the system and move forward. Now, an Indian audience don't really know Anurad Desanayka at all. How would you describe your new president to the audience in India who are curious to find out more about him personally? Well, he is a member of what is ostensibly a Marxist-Leninist party, the Janata Vimukti Perumana, or the People's Liberation uh, Party. He started his politics as a student activist and then went into major national mainstream politics. He served in the government of Chandrika Kumarathunga when the JVP, that's the Janata Vimukti Perumana, or the People's uh, Liberation Party, joined government. He served as Minister of Agriculture. And then they left government over a proposed power sharing agreement with the LTT in the north. And they have been, he, in that sense, he is the most, perhaps the most reformist of the leaders of the JVP. He doesn't come about, come across as being particularly aggressive or offensive. He talks the language of inclusion. Um, and he, I mean, at the same time, he is firm but generally more gentle in his demeanor as far as the general public is concerned. So Anura Kumara Dishanaka is probably the best candidate that a party with the baggage that the JVP carries from 88, 89, the terror and all of that, is probably the best candidate that they could have put forward. Now he has become president. And the question is, is he going to be a real decision maker and the real leader, or are there other people in the party, perhaps more wedded to the old, old ideology of the party, who will call the shots? That remains to be seen somewhat. But Anura Kumara Disanayaka is in himself a very popular candidate. And, and what's important also to emphasize is, is that he's really the first candidate from the common man. He's of the people. He doesn't come from Colombo. He doesn't come from a dynasty. None of that. So in that sense, he has a popular acceptance and a popular legitimacy. You raised an intriguing question, Dr. Swaranamuttu, when you suggested that many people want to know whether he'll be a proxy for more weathered people connected to the old ideology of the JVP. What's the answer to your question? Will he be a proxy or is he an independent man who will have the power in his own hands? Well, that remains to be seen. But let's say this. Anura Kumara Disanaka has been elected as a member of the National People's Power, NPP Alliance, of which the JVP is the main predominant political party. And there are others who are individuals, university professors, etc., who are members of the NPP. So the question here is, is that, is the policy, are the positions that the JV, that the new government is going to take Will they be largely JVP positions or will they be tempered in some way, perhaps, by the NPP, the new entrance, if you like, into the system? Anura Kumara Desanayake may well come across as the most popular, appealing and attractive. But the question is, does he have, if there is a tussle for power and influence, if there is a balance of power to be maintained, does he have enough forces behind him to do that? I'll come to that in a moment's time, but let me ask you first a more direct question about the JVP, his party, because that is an entity that is known of in India. As you mentioned, in the 70s and 80s, it was responsible for two insurrections against the Sri Lankan government with tens of thousands killed. Some estimates put the total killing almost at 70,000, 80,000. 
Is that background a cause of concern today for Sri Lankans, or is it now just history and has the page turned? Well, it is a concern for a minority of the electorate, and that might have been well been one factor why he didn't get 50 plus one on the first count. But at the same time, I think the anger and disgust with the political establishment is so strong that they have either forgotten or have forgiven what happened in the 1980s in particular. The other point, of course, is, is that there is the younger section where he has a stronghold, if you like, the younger section of the polity who were not born then and who don't actually remember the pain, the suffering and all of that that was inflicted upon them, both by the JVP and the anti-terror campaign of the government. Let so, all, sorry, please carry on. Please carry on. No, so all of those factors combine to suggest that look, there may not be such great concern about the baggage, if you like, the historic baggage that the JVP bring. Let's at this point talk about the way he will tackle the challenges he faces as president, because that's also one way of judging the extent to which he's going to temper the JVP's traditional, more hardline, more left-wing views. One of the critical challenges he faces is the economy. Although Ranil Vikramasinghe brought inflation down in August to 0.5% from a high of, I believe, 70% in 2022, I gather that still 27% of Sri Lanka's population remains below the poverty line and 20% face food insecurity. So how deep is the economic crisis that the president has to confront? It is very deep. We have lots of challenges to face. Now, the promise of the NPP in terms of their manifesto and during the election campaign was that they were going to emphasize welfare that the burden of adjustment to the new situation that we'd got ourselves into had been disproportionately placed on those least able to bear it. He's going to bring down taxes, both income tax as well as indirect taxes. He's talking about the money coming from tourism, from manufacturing industries. But you first of all need the money to invest in all of that before you can get any return. So what he has said during the campaign, what we need to find out is how this is going to be done. And the dotting of the I's and the crossing of the T's, because at one level, the devil will be definitely in the detail. He might be able to give instant relief, but we are not going to be paying back our debt, we say, for another five years. And in those five years, we have to collect the money to do so and put ourselves on the basis, on you know, on the track of sustainable growth. And that's where I think the tough decisions are going to have to be made. Now, I'm told that during the course of the campaign, Disanaika pledged to increase market competitiveness, transparency and efficiency, to increase Sri Lanka's share of foreign trade through export diversification, and also to increase foreign direct investment. First of all, Am I correctly informed that he's pledged to do these things? And if I am, does that mean that he's best thought of as left of center rather than classical Marxist? Yes, I don't think he's a classical Marxist. He's probably best thought of as being himself left of center. And I think he has gone out of his way to assure uh, foreign investors and other stakeholders in the economy that there is not going to be a kind of socialist takeover, if you like, of the economy and import substitution and all of that. But he does say that there will be due consideration being given to, well, a sort of import substitution type policy where local industries will be uh, given a certain amount of attention or more attention than they've hitherto been given. So the platform in terms of the campaign that he ran on as far as economy it's somewhat confusing in that it is not very clear as to which direction he will go on or which direction he will prioritize. And most importantly, I think it's going to depend on the majority that he has in parliament. He says that he's going to dissolve parliament by tomorrow or day after and get a new parliament in. And so there is the, the question there is, 
you know, how many of them are going to be considered hardcore JVPs who have a very different attitude towards economic development, and how many are going to be more moderate? Let me ask you one more question about his handling of the economy. Aru- Anura Disanayake has said that he will renegotiate the IMF package to lessen what he called the burden of austerity on the poor. Do you have any idea what precisely he's looking for? And do you have any sense of whether the IMF is likely to agree? Well, he has nevertheless reiterated that the fundamental outlines of the IMF agreement will remain as a framework, that that won't be renegotiated or anything like that, because that could well lead to a collapse of any prospects of uh, economic investments in the country. Now, within that framework, I suppose there is room to play around in terms of what monies are going to be allocated for X or Y. And I don't necessarily think that the IMF will have problems with that, as long as the framework of that agreement is maintained. Let's move beyond the economic challenge he faces. Dissanayaka has also pledged that he is going to abolish the executive presidency. In other words, he could end up being the last executive president of Sri Lanka. And presumably, if he does, Sri Lanka will revert to some form of prime ministerial democracy. Can you explain to an Indian audience how he and significant reform this would be if he does it? Well, Abolition of the executive presidency has been an issue around in Sri Lankan politics ever since we established the executive presidency in 1977, brought in a new constitution in 78. The problem there is is that I think the people are willing to see the abolition because it has to go through two-thirds in parliament and then uh, a referendum of the people. The problem has always been getting the two-thirds in parliament. Now, hopefully, that sentiment that, you know, you need a strong leader to do X and Y has changed. So the significance of the abolition of the executive presidency is that the executive presidency really has no check or balance on it. If you take the Rajpaksa, Gotabe Rajpaksa regime, they refused to go to, he refused to go to the IMF. Overnight, he changed from organic agricultural sub, uh, fertilizer to, uh, sorry, o- overnight he wanted to change to organic agricultural fertilizer from commercial um, uh, fertilizer. Then, again, a number of decisions that the president takes are really not up for any kind of transparency or accountability. Furthermore, the president appoints the secretaries to ministries. Now, the secretaries to ministries are the chief auditing and financial officers of those ministries. That's where the corruption comes because they have to account for it. And if they're presidential appointments, they do as their political masters say. So the consolidation of power in the presidency has been quite considerable. Whereas if you go to parliament, of course, a prime minister is always subject to a vote of confidence. And that is a check and balance. Um, well, I suppose the best one, apart from, of course, facing a general election. So abolition of the executive presidency, I think, will be very popular as far as the country at large is concerned. And I think it's vitally necessary to redesign and restructure the social contract that we have in Sri Lanka. Tell me, is there a problem in the fact that if he doesn't act very quickly to abolish the executive presidency, he might begin to enjoy having the enormous powers it confers on him, which is one reason why earlier presidents who committed themselves to abolish the executive presidency actually failed to do so. Might the same story repeat itself? Well, it could well repeat itself. But that is why the parliament that is elected at the next general election should be a properly reform-minded parliament that will put pressure on the chief executive to do the things that were promised during the campaign. Sure, absolutely right. Once he gets into office and he tastes that power, maybe he won't be interested in giving it up. But, well, one hopes and prays that that won't be the case.
Now, I read from the Sri Lankan press that the new president has also pledged to repeal the Prevention of Terrorism Act, which is widely considered in Sri Lanka to be draconian. He's also promised to establish a public prosecutor's office. Is there significant demand in Sri Lanka for this? And how would you evaluate these two steps? Okay, let's start with the Prevention of Terrorism. The Prevention of Terrorism Act, we went to Geneva to the Human Rights Council in 2015-16 and said that we would replace, we repeal and replace that. The government then came up with what is called the Anti-Terrorism Act, which in some respects is as bad or arguably even worse than the PTA or the Prevention of Terrorism Act. So it hasn't yet been brought to a vote in Parliament and one hopes that he will revisit it in terms of looking at it from a rights framework and perspective. I think that's very important that he does that in order to establish his faith, his commitment in democracy as far as the country is concerned. And I think people in the country at large will support him in respect of that. The second part of your question was with regard to? The public prosecutor's office, which he plans to yeah. establish. Yeah. Now, in the Sri Lankan situation, we have the Attorney General's Department, which embodies a basic conflict of interest. The Attorney General's Department defends the government in court and advises the government in court. It's also responsible for bringing prosecutions to court. Now, given that a number of the allegations with regard to corruption and atrocities, etc., are leveled against the government, you can't have the same person doing both things. So that's a low-hanging fruit in terms of restructuring that office. The Attorney General's Department perhaps can remain as the legal defense of the government in court and the legal advisor, but the question of prosecutions, I think, should be given to a separate prosecutor's office, and one hopes that Anil Kumar Adisanayake's government will do that. Now, the other big concern, and you mentioned this in your first answer during this interview, is corruption. Practically every single television news report from Colombo has highlighted this. And you said that you believe that in the very early days, he will seek to put, as you put it, a big fish in jail for corruption. Could that big fish be someone as important as Ranila Vikram Singer? There have been talk or speculation that People close to him are involved in corruption. Well, I mean, as far as Anru Kumar Desanaka is concerned, when questioned about this, he says that, look, we will act against anyone without any fear, without any exemption. So if there is evidence that the former president and those close to him were engaged in corruption, they would take cases against them. And I take it that that would be a very popular measure in Sri Lanka because all the Vox Pop reports that we've seen are people saying they want to see people who've made money wrongly pay for it? Absolutely. Absolutely. It will be a very popular decision. But due process has to be observed. And that's more difficult. That's where the problem might well lie. Yeah. Now, something that all three candidates talked about during the campaign was devolving more power to regional governments. If that happens... And it may not because the 13th Amendment has been hanging fire for pretty close to 40 years. But if that happens, will that make a very significant difference to the way Sri Lanka is governed? Well, as you know, the 13th Amendment was passed in the late 1980s. But there are two aspects of the 13th Amendment that haven't been granted to either of the any of the provinces. That is powers with regard to land and powers with regard to the police. I think the question of land... All of the parties are more or less agreed on that that should actually be devolved and that could well happen within a year of the uh, new government. There is a bit of a dispute with regard to police, that if you give police powers to the north and east in particular, that the police will be armed and that that could form the core, if you like, of a militant movement in the future. But that has got to be discussed. Yes, all of these parties are committed to devolution and a new constitution. The question is, how far beyond the 13th Amendment are they willing to go? And that has not been made clear or indeed even talked about 
by any of the political parties so far. So what I would end research is a series of discussions and consultations to go beyond the 13th Amendment and put all of that into a new constitution. Wouldn't this, in a sense, represent a very significant U-turn for the JVP, which in the 80s was strenuously against greater power to the north and northeast. Now their president candidate is talking about a greater devolution. Absolutely. It's a complete change as far as the JVP is concerned in respect of devolution. And as a consequence, I think, of that change, Anur Kumar Adesanayake was able to win votes, not that many, but win votes in the predominantly Tamil and Muslim areas of the North and East. He says he wants to be president of all the people in Sri Lanka. And he recognizes that in order to do that, you have to look at governance, you have to look at the constitutional questions, and you have to give equality or equal dignity to all citizens in the country. Tell me, Dr. Sarvaramuthu, how is Anura Kumara Disanaika viewed by Sri Lanka's 11% Tamil community? I know the Tamil issue was not a key issue in this election campaign, and that perhaps is the first time for 20, 30 years that it hasn't been. And that's a remarkable thing. And equally, I know that there were Tamil candidates amongst the 38 contesting for the presidency, but they didn't do very well at all. Nonetheless, now that he's won and he is president and he was sworn in earlier today, how are the Tamils likely to view him? Well, I think the Tamil community in terms of the younger people and those who are, again, particularly angry and annoyed with the corruption and all of that, are supporting Anura Kumar Adesanayaka. Even if they didn't vote for him, they are sympathetic <clears throat> to his arguments that only the JVP or APP will do anything with regard to corruption. The issue of the daily burden of living, the joblessness, perhaps has taken precedence in certain quarters of the Tamil and Muslim community as well over the question of political and constitutional rights. And to that extent, I think they are not hostile, but they are more accommodating of the NPP and the position that the NPP is taking. So unlike many other earlier Sinhala presidents, he would have at least a small opening because there are many areas where his campaign has struck a chord with the people up north and northeast. Yes, I think it has struck a chord. Uh, and in terms of previous presidents, President Chandrika Bandana Kumarathunga, of course, is very much pro devolution and all of that. But yes, I think the whole question of the economic governance and improving that and bringing investment and all of that has struck a responsive chord. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. My last big question before I end the interview, how will Sri Lanka's relationship with India be affected by Disanayake becoming the new president? We in India believe that he's closer to China than he is to India, although he did visit India in February this year at the specific invitation of the Indian government. But what do you believe will be his attitude to India? Well, as you said, I mean, he's visited India and when your national security advisor came, he met with them and all of that. I think there is a recognition that there is an Indian interest in Sri Lanka, there is a Chinese interest, and they're probably represented also by the economic stake. 
we have to develop a policy, and I think Andra Kumara is very uh, aware of this, and in fact, in his acceptance speech today, he said so, that we have to be friends with everyone. We do know that India is a long, long-standing relationship. It's a love-hate relationship at one level. We cannot turn our backs on India in any respect. We know that the Chinese, as a consequence of what the Rajapaksas did, have a larger stake in our economy than before. So we have to learn to balance the two off against each other. And therefore, in a sense, I suppose, you know, we talk about non-alignment and all of that. I think that's a thing of the past. It's somewhat passé. But now we are talking about being multi-aligned. We will be engaging with any country that is going to help us to get the investment that is required for Sri Lanka to grow. What about wind power projects run by the Adanis located in Colombo? There's a lot of speculation that that project in particular could be scrapped. A, is that speculation correct or near about correct? And secondly, could there be other economic projects which, given his JVP background, he might want to review, reconsider, and perhaps even scrap? As far as the Adani project is concerned, the resistance, the dissent, the criticisms of that project were largely civil society based. And they have gone to court, and the Supreme Court is still hearing the case as far as the Adani project is concerned. So there are lots of questions as to how that particular project came about. And they're not necessarily questions at all about being pro or anti-Indian. It's specific to how that project came and what are the conditions, etc., with regard to that project. As far as the future is concerned, I mean, I don't think that there will be any kind of anti-Indian sentiment. What is interesting, as you said, I mean, in this election is, is that those people who were particularly fervent about India getting involved in Sri Lanka to gobble us up and went onto the streets with regard to the uh, comprehensive economic agreement and all of that, they have not fared well at all as far as this presidential election is concerned. And hopefully that will continue into the general election. So I don't think that there will be necessarily a sort of you know, harking back to the 1980s and anti-Indian stance. I think the point will be made that, look, we have to be aware of India's interests. We also have to recognize that India is a growing economic power. And in order to grow, we too should align with India to the extent that that is possible. Finally, I know his day is over. I imagine the sun has set on his career. But nonetheless, how would you evaluate two years that he spent as president of Sri Lanka and how much of the credit for pulling Sri Lanka up from that terrible mess it was in two years ago goes to Ranil Vikramasinghe? Well, Ranil Vikramasinghe has been the political leader who's been in politics for a long, a long, long time. He's always been recognized for having a certain amount of expertise with regard to the economy. His shortcomings have always been that he's not the most communicative person. He's not the popular politician who hugs babies and does all of that kind of thing. So I think as time recedes, people will recognize that, yes, he was the one who put us onto a stable footing. And if this current government, JVP government, is able to go forward, I think they will also recognize that, yes, whilst what he did had shortcomings, Whilst what he did had problems with regard to, you know, squashing dissent or whatever, on the civil rights and democratic front, I, there was a lot that fell short. But that he did succeed in putting Sri Lanka back on its feet, as it were, and on the road to recovery. Putting Sri Lanka back on its feet looked very difficult to do in 2022 when the Rajapaksas were in power, Gothabaya fled. Mahinda Rajapaksa resigned the prime ministership. But if he's done that, does he now today deserve a small thank you? Of course he does. And I think uh, as a consequence of uh, the elections and all of that, I mean, even Andhra Kumara has conceded that Ranil Vikramasinghe paid yeoman service and that, you know, history will at the end of the day judge. And I don't think that judgment will be overly critical at all. It will mark appreciation 
for having put Sri Lanka back on the road to recovery. Dr. Saran Moto, thank you very much for the time you spared for me and thank you for helping the Indian audience understand what sort of person Anura Kumara Disanaika is and what sort of president he's likely to be. I thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.